Hello everyone, welcome to our last lecture for business ethics. It's hard to believe it's already over. This quarter really flew by for me. Um, we got a lot of stuff to talk about tonight. Um, the topic is success and the American dream, but really this is just going to be code for talking about the meaning of life. Um, and I'll make some connections there about why it's going to go that way. But um, before I get started with all the stuff from Wines, um, I did want to say a couple things about the response paper. Um, I know that uh, probably no one's going to watch this video in time uh, for the response paper doing being due by tomorrow night, maybe, but my guess is you're probably working on it. Um, my uh, document instructions told you everything you need to know about that. But I wanted to say something about what's going to happen next, because just like I took the initial paper drafts and uh, made them anonymous and then redistributed them for the purpose of the response paper, I will be taking your response paper uh, assignments, making them anonymous, and then giving them back to the original author. So you should be getting um, probably Tuesday next week uh, after final grades are submitted. I'll do this whole project. Um, but you uh, expect that you'll be getting that, um, getting a response from your peer reviewer uh, about your paper. And um, the first thing I want to kind of say about that is just like I, in the instructions I talked about being uh, charitable and critical in your, um, in your response and your evaluation, your critical evaluation of the, the paper and that other students work, um, kind of recognize that the spirit in which that criticism might be given to you. Um, I, I can't make any promises for how people are going to behave themselves in these assignments and, and I don't, I definitely don't go through and uh, like look to censor them or something like that. If there is something that pops up, uh, by all means let me know. Um, I'd be happy to talk to you about it, but I'm not like reviewing all these things and deciding whether I deem it acceptable to send or not. Um, I treat this as part of uh, public discourse, but um, there, I'm instructing everyone to be critical in their responses. And uh, being critical doesn't necessarily mean that um, people are attacking you. Um, hopefully they'll just be, if they're on good behavior and following things like the Code of Intellectual Conduct, then um, they will uh, be offering constructive criticism, uh, cooperative, truth-seeking types of criticism. Uh, and I encourage you to read it that way. Um, if you have questions about that, I would be happy to talk to you. And I've talked to other students in the past, because I do this kind of thing for some of my other classes too. And I have had a couple students be like, I don't know how to take this, Tim. Um, like, is this crossing a line or not? Or what do you think about it? And I'd be happy to help you process that and figure that out. But um, my hope is that it'll be helpful to see someone else's perspective on it. Um, and help you look at your own ideas from a different angle. Uh, so far with uh, like reading everyone's work over the course of this quarter, I don't have any particular concerns uh, about something happening. Usually the biggest concern I have for these assignments is that people pull their punches and don't really give as uh, direct a criticism as they maybe should to fulfill the instructions for the assignment. I have had some students who I, I know deeply disagree with the paper that they were given because of their writing on other topics at other times. But in their response paper, they like didn't bring any, they didn't give the impression at all like they deeply disagreed. <laughs> so um, hopefully that will happen and, uh, and hopefully it'll be positive. And if it isn't or if you want to just talk about it, um, I'd be happy to. Um, just like I said in the instructions to the response paper, um, don't expect that the student who wrote your paper is you know a professional philosopher who's able to be super clear or has the best arguments or any of that kind of stuff like be understanding be understanding of that when it comes to the receiving of the the critical response as well i think that that'd be good advice also um if you want advice or feedback critical feedback evaluation um, response from me i'm really really happy to do that because of the way that BC sets up their grading schedule and everything, I will not have any time to do this before grades are submitted. Um, I just need to read through them and, and grade them. Um, but if you want some written feedback or you want to talk to me on the phone about your paper uh, or have me record a video um, talking about your paper, I'd be very happy to do that. I'm going to have two weeks off here after I get grades done before summer quarter. So I should have time to, to knock a bunch of those out. So 
Um, let me know though. Uh, send me an email, text me, call me um, if you're interested in that, and I'd be happy to oblige. Um, so let me know. Uh, okay, that's I think all the big picture stuff I want to talk about. Oh, hmm, something else. I'll talk about it now. I usually talk about it at the end, but I want to talk about it now because it's very. There's a very high chance I'll forget <laughs> if I am always forgetting about the uh, uh, codes for the videos. Um, and with all the stuff that we have to talk about with wines, um, it could easily escape my memory. So I'm going to talk about this now. Um, I like to always tell all of my students at the end of a quarter that uh, I do not take a sort of attitude as an instructor where after the quarter is over, like, I'm done with you, like, my business is concluded with you. Um, I have given you my um, contact information, my cell phone, my email, um, on the syllabus, it's there, uh, and I gave it to you because I wanted you to use it this quarter, and I still want you to use it. Uh, if you, if students want to contact me long after they ever took a class with me, um, I always welcome that. I really enjoy um, catching up with students, um, and if you ever want to talk about anything, maybe some business ethics stuff that happens to you in your career as you get going, or uh, just thinking about some of the material from this class more, um, or just want to talk about philosophy in general, um, think of me as a contact, um, as part of your network, uh, a resource that you can draw on whenever. Um, I, I'm, I'm happy to, to keep that connection alive. Uh, my door is always open to you, in other words. Um, so uh, don't be shy. Don't. I definitely, just like I've uh, kind of said at the beginning of the quarter about like, don't worry about bugging me and stuff like that during the quarter, it's still definitely true here uh, leaving the quarter as well. So. Um, I'll always welcome a conversation with you. There's many of you that, uh, mm, there's some of you that I feel like I got to know over the course of the quarter that we had some more correspondence. I know the online class is a little less of that than when you're in person together and seeing each other a couple times a week. Um, but, uh, some, so some of you I, I've had the chance and the pleasure to have some more extended correspondence with. Um, others of you I've barely talked to at all during the course of the quarter. Um, but whether you're in one camp or the other, I would definitely welcome a conversation with you. This is not just a message I'm sending out to the, the people I've, I've formed some kind of rapport with this quarter, but it's to all of you. Um, and it's, uh, I, I guess, maybe never too late is not quite the right sentiment here, but um, but yeah, just that I'm, I'm a, a resource that's available to you uh, if you ever want to use it. So don't be shy. Um, there was something else I was going to say about that. Um, oh, yeah, uh, so pat yourself on the back for getting through this quarter. We've covered a lot of conceptual and theoretical territory, um, and we're going to do a big download of it tonight, too. Um, and there's many, I think, opportunities where um, you might have experienced this class as just sort of uh, touching the tip of the iceberg, uh, and there's a whole lot more to it, too. So... Um, You've got all the readings um, and supplemental materials and things like that. And if you ever want to kind of dig through them a little bit more in the future and contact me to talk about that, I'd be really happy to do that. Um, maybe you take a look at those um, primary source readings for the ethical theories that I didn't officially assign at the beginning of the quarter during our crash course. Taking a look at those, digging into them more. Um, I, in, I don't know. I'm, we'll see how, how things go tonight with the lecture, but I might end up rushing parts of the wine lecture. We'll, we'll see about that. Um, but cert, even, if, even if I don't rush the wines lecture, there's tons of just things that are being like, there's this and this and this and just kind of populating a radar, but not necessarily like diving into it super deeply. And if you want to um, carry on some of the conversations that we've started this quarter in this class with me after the end of the quarter, I'd totally welcome that. Um, studying philosophy is not something you do for just a quarter, I think. I think it's a life, lifetime pursuit, um, and there's always more to do. And I'm a very happy partner uh, to participate in that journey with you. Uh, it's why I'm a teacher in the first place. So uh, I hope you believe my sincerity at this point with the actions from uh, this quarter, um, that those words um, hopefully mean something. I've been able to back that up. Okay, uh, so getting into wines, um, lots of stuff to talk about here. Um, you're welcome, Tanya. 
Um, so uh, we're going to be talking about the meaning of life, but what is the connection here? Um, sometimes I feel like uh, people might think that the world of ethics and morality and then the world of the meaning of life are two separate things, and I don't think they really are. Um, really, the question of ethics and morality really is the question of the meaning of life, maybe not in quite as highfalutin language as that, but it's, you know, ethics are about what's good and bad and right and wrong and what are the ultimate ends that we should be setting as our goals. Um, and that's really what the meaning of life is all about, too. What's valuable, what's meaningful, um, what is the purpose of life, or what purpose should we give to ourselves in life is really what, what that question is all about. So in some ways, this isn't anything new. Um, this topic isn't something separate from everything that we've been doing the whole quarter, especially thinking back to like the big picture ethical theories from the, the crash course, for instance. Those are definitely about ultimate questions of value and meaning. Um, but there's another kind of dichotomy that I think deserves uh, some special attention and why this is kind of something a little different. So for example, um, well there's a couple ways I'm going to attack this. First angle is that um, there, there's sometimes, um, and, and actually many of you over the course of this quarter from looking at your uh, from having conversations and looking at your journals and reading comments and things like that, um, a lot of people have at some point or another during the course of the quarter sort of uh, set moral and ethical considerations off against what we might call practical concerns. That there's kind of like this sense of, well, well, these ethical values and principles are all well and good, but then there are these like practical dimensions of life um, that complicate that or problematize that, something like that. And in some ways, I can I can understand why uh, where that perspective might come from. Um, I think I've mentioned before this idea that um, I'm very familiar with people taking an attitude more to morality, kind of like paying your taxes, where it's sort of like you fulfill your obligations, you know, you pay your taxes to the government, and once you've fulfilled your responsibility to the government. Whatever is left over is yours to do with as you please. And in a similar way, I think sometimes people take this attitude toward morality of like paying morality its due, you know, fulfilling your basic moral obligations, and then the rest of your life is there to do whatever you want to with it. Um, but really those practical considerations that might complicate following these higher ideals of morality and things like that are not themselves distinct from that discussion. Uh, practical considerations are still a matter of value. They're things you care about, um, things that you find meaningful and, and important in your life um, and that you're afraid of losing or compromising. Um, maybe there are some things that morality demands or is asking for, you feel some kind of uh, obligation toward that um, might be uh, intention or incompatible with some of those other sources of meaning and value that you want to pursue in your life. And just like especially over the last unit on social and economic justice, we might want to rethink our assumptions or our the sort of fundamental assumptions or um, starting points for perspective when it comes to big picture matters like justice, um, moral obligation, social structure, the, the rules of society, all this kind of stuff. Um, that uh, that we could also do some critical reflection on the things that we care about individually in our own lives and what we find meaningful. But that's also worth critically rethinking in the kind of philosophical mood. And that's what I really think we're going to be doing here uh, tonight with wines. Um, that we're going to look at a bunch of different models for meaning of kind of ways that you can think about your life in the big picture of what you care to pursue and how you're going to count your life as a successful one. Um, under what conditions would you see it as a success um, that you've accomplished uh, what you want to or really what should be the goals that you set up to attempt to accomplish that will set the conditions for success too, uh, how you define success. Um, so we're going to be looking at that. That's kind of the, uh, the framing or focus for, for tonight. Um, I've, uh, I actually, I, I remember when I was talking about this this afternoon with my on-campus class, um, I brought up, I can't remember exactly the connection here, but, oh, right, 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 that's the connection. Um, when we are going to look at all these different models of meaning that Wines discusses, uh, and I'm going to walk you through all of them, 
Um, there's what they really I think show you is that there are a lot of different ways to approach the question of the meaning of life. There's a lot of angles to take it from or ways to be related to it. Um, and I think that's really similar to, again, not this isn't any different than with ethics and morality, that we have a lot of different relationships that we have to morality itself. And I think in many times those two relationships kind of overlap a lot. So whether you um, kind of experience morality as uh, a kind of monkey on your back or as a guilt shame machine or something like that or whether you see morality as just like the sincere pursuit of what is good and that moral reflection just helps you do something that you already want to do that it's something you take joy in doing rather than a burden of guilt and then there's all sorts of other shades of other flavors of emotions and relationships in between those two things um, I think the same thing is true with how we think about our lives, how we're related to ourselves and our own lives um, through a context or a lens of meaning. So there's a lot of options here. And, and uh, as kind of Wines talks about at the very end of his paper, um, he, he says, and I, I think I agree with him on this, there's a, bu a bunch of things I don't agree with Wines about, just to be honest. I'll talk about that in a second. But I kind of agree with Wines that for the most part, our lives, oh, I'm breaking up? Can you hear me? Could not hear several words. Okay, now it's good? Okay, cool. Um, okay, if it happens again, let me know. Uh, I hope it's not a problem with my microphone, so just, just in case. Okay, it might be an internet, but if just in case it's the microphone, let me know so I can make sure that everyone... Uh, here's what's going on. Thank you. Uh, what was I saying? Um, uh, let's see. Oh, I totally lost it. Oh, right, right, right. Okay. Um, so Wines is talking at the end of the paper about how in in our world today, not many of us find time or opportunity or maybe just choose to like think about these big questions about meaning of life um, and much less to critically rethink our assumptions about it and look at other options and possibilities. Um, and he, I think Wines thinks in large part that's due to, it's, it's not just a matter of us not choosing to do it, um, but it's also like modern life encourage us, encourages us not to, <laughs> that there's a lot of other things going on that are distractions or burdens on, and cares on, uh, on our attention that don't leave us with a lot of bandwidth to do this. But um, maybe you have thought, maybe you haven't, but maybe you have thought about these questions from time to time, that you've picked up this chestnut uh, of the meaning of life and wanted to reflect on it um, and think like, what, what is my conception of the meaning of life and, and how should I maybe think about it? And I think another thing that sometimes keeps us from, and this is something more about us than necessarily our environment, but one thing that might keep us from thinking about this question more uh, critically and reflectively is that it can just get so overwhelming. Um, I remember feeling this way many times uh, when I was younger, and still do occasionally, um, about how uh, once you start exploring that world, it's just there's so many possibilities. There, it seems like there's an infinite diversity of values that people have or perspectives they could take on life, much less things that are informed from personal experience, which is all so different from each person. Um, and trying to like even get a handhold on how to orient in that exploration, much less get to an answer, um, can, can be really overwhelming, I think. And I think sometimes that's what also uh, stops us. So as soon as, even if we start trying to think about it, we're like, oh, yeah. And they're just like, oh, whoa, too much, too much, too much. Um, that's where I think philosophy is really helpful again. Um, I, I've mentioned before from the beginning of the quarter uh, that I am a fan of theory. I think studying ethical theory is not just idealistic castles in the sky kind of stuff, um, but that it empowers us to be able to think in specific situations with uh, more awareness, more sensitivity, um, and gives us the kind of conceptual vocabulary, I've used that term before, to be able to understand and articulate our feelings and perspectives and opinions and values and things like that. Um, and I think that's no different here. And that's why I wanted to include this in the curriculum. 
Um, I don't like Wines very much. Uh, in terms of his own philosophical contributions in this article, I'm like, some of them are, eh, okay. But I'm not really jazzed about him or anything like that. So don't get the wrong impression. I don't, I don't feel like Wines has got his finger on the button of meaning of life or anything like that. The reason I chose Wines uh, as a selection for this unit is because he does do a really good job of packing a lot of the material, uh, part of the territory of this debate about the meaning of life in a pretty small space. Um, I, I think the most valuable part of the whole article is when he's walking through these different models and, and really probably more the part about the product models for success rather than the process ones. I'll talk about that later in the lecture, what my problems are with that. But um, especially the product ones. Um, there's there even though there is this I do think there is this infinite diversity oh no maybe it's when I'm moving my microphone is this better you can hear me now without breaking up okay I'll try to keep it still um, yeah so even even with all this diversity of, of particular visions of the meaning of life that are out there there are categories that we can kind of group them into, these different models of meaning um, that bear certain structural similarities to each other. And I think it's helpful to track, like, if you're going to start fleshing out the vision of the meaning of life, what are the choices to be made? You know, like, what are the options? I, there's like, you could go on this issue, you could go this way, or you could go this way. Or over here, you could go this way and this way. And getting some of that kind of formal and theoretical um, uh, accounting for the different options, I think gives us some useful ways to start getting a hand uh, to get a grip on certain parts of what is a massive, massive overwhelming issue <laughs> and start to explore it in a useful, productive sort of way. So uh, that's definitely my hope for this lecture, is that going through it, that you'll um, maybe be more empowered uh, and to be able to get a start on thinking about this for yourself. We're definitely not going to get to any answers here. <laughs> uh, we'll look at answers, but which one is the best answer or the most rationally defensible or something like that. We're definitely not going to settle anything here tonight. Um, but I hope that this gives you some food for thought. Um, there's a lot of cool ideas here in these models um, that are worth kicking around and uh, maybe doing future exploration with. Um, and again, I'd be happy to continue that dialogue and conversation with you uh, if you want to do it. Um, okay, so... I don't like wines very much. He's pretty messy at times too. I mean, in terms of philosophical work, I don't I don't think that he is some kind of huge exemplar here. Um, but the content is useful. I also have a little note here. Um, so yeah, I say this is going to be sloppy. Lots of ideas all over the place. Lot to sift through. Probably won't make final decisions. Um, but maybe we can kick some ideas around and and maybe grow a little bit. Um, a little different in the online version because uh, usually there's a lot of lively class discussion that's happening when I'm giving this lecture and we're kicking stuff around. But um, So this time it'll have to just kind of be one-sided a little bit. Um, but I really encourage you to, to talk about these ideas with people. I, I have learned way more um, about even my own perspective by just having to articulate it to someone who's not me rather than just when I'm sitting with myself and hmm, pondering and stuff like that. I, I think... Um, I, well, in general, I think a lot of the most useful philosophical efforts happen uh, when there's other people involved, when it's relational uh, in a cooperative sort of way. Um, so I also have a note here about how Wines is pretty opinionated. Um, I encourage you to, you know, don't nitpick him too much. Like I said, I don't think he's all that strong in terms of his philosophical positions, but he's good at introducing ideas. So avoid a uh, fallacy of trivial objections or straw man here. Um, I think there are things to complain about with some of Wine's things, but um, you know th this is just kind of a food for thought kind of thing. Uh, you don't have to agree with Wine's uh, or his opinion on certain ideas as much as maybe thanking him for putting some stuff on the table, and that's that's what I that's my attitude towards him. Um, there are one one example here <clears throat> of something that I've had students complain about in the past is that Wines is too preoccupied with this whole uh, issue of cultural hegemony um, and privilege from white males. Uh, he complains about that quite a bit, um, kind of all over the place. Um, and I think uh, I think this is a, a real concern, and it's relevant for the meaning of life. 
um, social justice is certainly a big part of, of life. I'm not trying to downplay that at all. But I say uh, right here, this concern is only one part of our reflections on the meaning of life. And I say arguably small given the scope of the question. And I want to be really clear about what I mean by that. Um, and I think this is helpful uh, for thinking about meaning of life in general. Do I mean that the issue... Ugh, oh, no. I don't think I was moving. I th maybe it's an internet thing. I don't know. We'll see. Is it better right now? Just kind of... It's just in and out all the time, huh? Hmm. I'm sorry. Um, I'm sorry that that's happening for you. Thank you. Thank you for letting me know. It's it's helpful for me to diagnose what's happening. Um, so I I don't mean that the issue of um, social injustice or uh, cultural inequality or things like that is a small issue. It's a massive issue. But we're not, we're also thinking about the meaning of life. This is about as big of a stage as we could possibly imagine. Um, I am, uh, you know I'm a fan of Star Trek. I wear the Star Trek hat all the time. Um, and one thing that I've always loved about Star Trek is that when it's imagining this idealistic future uh, centuries from now when um, poverty, sexism, racism, all sorts of these uh, evils of human society and human civilization have been dealt with. And those, then when those problems have been um, defeated, that there's still so many more things to think about and to work on um, when it comes to the meaning of life and all the rest. And I think uh, definitely the issues of um, cultural inequality is one of the big issues of our time. It's, it's something that characterizes our moment in history in a really big and powerful way. And it's a huge problem. And many, many philosophers have been thinking about it and working on it and trying to figure out what's the best way to make sense of it and what to do about it. Um, but it's also, in the grand scheme of things, a moment in time. And there's more to humanity than those sorts of issues. And we could the, the, the big questions of meaning of life that we're going to be discussing here uh, tonight um, are questions that would still remain even if we... If, even if we were able to defeat things like intolerance, inequality, and injustice, uh, we'd still have things to disagree about and things to explore critically. Um, so that's all I mean by that. I'm not trying to minimize that issue uh, at all. Um, but there are, there's just more to life than the bullshit that we've done. <laughs> um, that's kind of my point. Um, as I say here, Criticizing cultural hegemony on its own is not enough of a foundation to build a meaningful life. I'm not saying, also, again, that a life, uh, if you devoted your life to activism, to dealing with this problem, I don't think that would be a meaningless life or something like that. Um, but if you were to do that, if you were to focus on that issue, it's informed by a lot of bigger picture issues about why this would be something worth doing and what is the basis or foundation of your commitment to that cause. Uh, and in fact, there's a specific model of meaning that would connect exactly with that that we're going to be discussing in, in just a little while. So um, that's definitely not to say that uh, being concerned about this, um, these kinds of issues, and trying to do something about it is not meaningful or not part of a meaningful life. Okay. All righty. So, uh, some, oh man, there's so many things to talk about. I'm going to have to keep this lecture going, or I'm going to, there's so many possible tangents to go on. Okay, so I'll try to be good here. I, I, I Initially, I was planning to do this for a week, but we don't have a week. Okay, um, there are some, this preliminary section um, that Wines gets into is interesting. Um, it asks some of the biggest issues uh, related to you know, options for how you would even approach the question of meaning of life in the first place. And even though I'm just going to move through them really quickly, I do not want to minimize them either. These are big issues, and philosophers, there are some philosophers who have, like, made this the main sort of things that they end up talking about, and they've written whole books on this kind of stuff. There is a lot to explore here, too. Um, but the first kind of reflection is about how insignificant humanity is in the universe. Um, causally, this is absolutely true. Uh, and sometimes this causes people to despair about meaning or that what happens in my life doesn't really matter at all. 
And I think that uh, depends on an assumption that I think is highly questionable, which is that the meaning of a person's life or what happens in it is directly proportionate to its causal impact. And I don't think that that can be true. I, 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 um, I reject that premise personally. That in order for humans to matter, we'd have to be major movers and shakers in the broader multiverse or something like that. Like that, that doesn't seem plausible. Um, even a single person's life, uh, meaningful things can happen in it. Even though one person is this causally this little speck of dust um, in a vast cosmos, um, but there are some th some things that. Um, some people have used as sources of despair here, and there's a deeper story. So my quick response is just that, a quick response. It might be the start of a conversation. Maybe there's some other way to make an argument here, like the charge that it's absurd, If you've ever that life is absurd, fundamentally. That's a, some existentialists have adopted this sort of view. Uh, Albert Camus is a really famous version of this um, that maybe some of you have read. Um, uh, and there's, there's questions here about um, what, do, what does it mean that we are just one, you know, person in a sea of people on a planet that exists in a sea of planets and stars and galaxies and, right? Like, we have to be, I think we have to be careful to think about what model of meaning are we using to make some kind of evaluation based on that fact. Um, there's also some questions here about, um, God uh, is God required to have meaning? Um, does there does do humans need to be maybe centrally significant in some metaphysical way, like through God creating us or something like that? But with all that kind of stuff, the cosmology and the, the theology, there is a kind of common thread here, and it's a question of whether meaning in life uh, is something that life has intrinsically, or if it's something contingent. In other words. Is life fundamentally meaningful, or is meaning the kind of thing that could sometimes happen or sometimes not happen? Like, as in, you could have a meaningful life, but you could also have a meaningless life. Like, meaning is possible, but also the absence of it is possible too. Or is meaning happening all the time? Uh, is everything, is, is meaning universally accessible or not? Um, I think a lot of the cosmological and theological discussions of meaning, in some ways, boil down to that question. And I think that's a, wor a, a good question to ask. Um, even if you don't believe in God, uh, approaching theological arguments for meaning with that lens on means you might be able to get something out of that conversation. Um, and by the way, since I brought up God and religion, um, certainly religious perspectives are a big part of this conversation. Uh, you know I'm religious too, so um, and I'm a secular philosopher, so I'm, I'm big on the conversation between those worlds. Um, <clears throat> and I don't see any reason why there isn't a lot of room here for that conversation to happen. The kinds of models of meaning that we're going to look at below and how they get separated, um, you'll notice that there isn't a category for religious meaning. Not directly. There's one that's kind of really connected with it, but I'll get into that when we get there. Um, but in some ways, uh, there there isn't in my... So maybe this is... I should turn my hat for this one. I don't think there's a distinctively religious model of meaning. I think in many ways, uh, different religions or even different opinions within religious traditions, like disagreement within a particular religion, come down to w which of these models of meaning is the lens through which you're looking at the theological, spiritual world. Um, the same sort of options emerge in a religious context as in a secular context um, for these questions about meaning of life. That's a little Tim two cents on that issue. Um, but uh, another thing that might sometimes these really big picture reflections might get us into, the cosmological and the theological, might get us into whether uh, the meaning of life is something worth asking at all, <laughs> whether that's a question that's worth spending time on. And um, I kind of gave a quick argument earlier today in the lecture here that um, I think it's good to rethink these things because they definitely direct our life choices. Um, morality and ethics hopefully direct our life choices but when we're thinking about all the rest of our life like what I was calling the practical considerations um, there there are still theoretical commitments we have whether we know them or not there is a pattern to how we approach meaning in our lives and how that informs our choices and I think that is worth um, 
reflecting on. Um, in some ways, I think this is what people who have midlife crises, uh, the so-called midlife crisis, that's what they're really reflecting on. What am I doing with my life? What are my priorities? What do I really value? Um, what's my purpose? Things like that. And uh, you don't have to wait until a midlife crisis happens to put that on your plate. In many ways, philosophy, I think, is artificially uh, creating a midlife crisis intentionally. And that can be a very healthy thing to do, I think. Um, and it might even be part of meaning itself. We could talk about that. Um, but I'm curious what you think about this. Usually in this section of the lecture, I, I talk to my, the students who are in front of me and, and hear what they're having to say about that. And it's another opportunity for discussion. Don't have that as much here on the online thing. But um, uh, I, I think it's worth kind of thinking for yourself uh, going through. I don't know how much time you have to watch this lecture. But uh, if, it, if there was a more comfortable amount of time or you're watching, you watch the video again after the quarter is over, like starting and stopping it and being like, what do I think about that before going on to the next bit of material? I, I think is a, not a bad idea. Okay, then uh, Wines talks about a much more specific um, idea of meaning that is definitely going to be in this category of a contingent model of meaning, a way in which life could be meaningful or meaningless, and that's this idea of the American dream. And I know I put this in the title for this unit, but I'm, I'm actually not planning on talking a whole heck of a lot about the American Dream. If we had a full week, I would spend more time on this, especially if it was in class and I could and we could have a big discussion about it. But um, I, the reason why I think there's room to think about this more, even though I'm not going to be spending a ton of time on it, um, is that the American Dream is a model of meaning. And I, like I say here, sometimes the American Dream has been used in other ways, like as an advertising or propaganda campaign. Um, <clears throat> but those kind of more cynical uses of it, or as like political rhetoric or something like that, even the cynical uses are uh, derivative of how this idea of the American dream can have purchase on us as a possible vision for meaning. Um, and the way that Wines sort of defines it is that whether this was earlier in America's history where the dream was freedom and the eye to using this freedom to compete for available wealth or now he says it's plausibly a dream of the elimination of social ills and on notions of entitlement I mean what he sees as the bottom line here is that the American dream is always about some kind of economic uh, uh, acquisition it's a matter of the prospect of um, acquiring wealth um, and material uh, goods. So it's a materialistic kind of um, of dream. Now I think in some ways that is far too reductive. Um, and I, I think there's a lot of other conceptions of what the American dream is and every time I've taught this, this is my first time doing it online, but every time I've taught it before it's been on campus and, and it happened this afternoon too with my on-campus class. Every time I've taught it um, I, I can Oh, no, no, no. I guess this afternoon we didn't talk about it. I wanted to, but I think we ran out of time. Yeah, I was planning on it, and then we didn't really, we didn't get into it too much. Um, but when I've had time to talk about this with students, I've found that when I ask them what is their vision of the American dream, what does the American dream mean to them, I get very different answers. Sometimes it has to do with um, material matters, um, and many other times it doesn't. Um, I think the the freedom thing is is a big component of it, um, but it might not always be freedom to be able to compete in the market for wealth or something like that. Um, it can be uh, to live in a uh, tolerant society. Sometimes it's that um, working towards social justice, um, the values of equality um, and uh, justice for all, things like that. There's a lot of or pluralism, for example. Uh, America is the melting pot, the great experiment, these kinds of things. I think there's some other possible values um, to find in what the American dream could mean. But what might be uh, useful here, and, and this is why I'm not going to talk too much about the American dream directly, is to see how the way that we cash out something like the American dream and what meaning it has for us <clears throat> is really going to be derivative of how we understand success in general. Um, and how we understand these models of meaning, like the list we're about to look through uh, in detail, um, that's really what's going to be informing that. Um, I, I think it's interesting maybe to think about whether there's something unique 
about America in this regard, whether there's a uniquely American model of meaning or something like that. Um, color me skeptical <laughs> on that. Um, but it might be that in, in the um, appropriation of ideas from all sorts of places, maybe the the sum the whole is more than the sum of the parts so there might there might be something distinctive there um, but I think that's worth re the thinking on reflecting on uh, your vision of the American dream might lead you as an access point to thinking about where you sit on these other questions about meaning okay now the next um, the next kind of major uh, locus point for you know, getting a handhold on thinking about questions about meaning of life is this distinction that Wines makes about success. And I think this is a very useful one. Um, there's there's kind of two ways that we could uh, just sort of define success theoretically. There's a really thin definition, and, and these are definitions, by the way, that don't prejudge the content of success, like what are the goals you're striving for, what are the objects of value to pursue, things like that. Um, but this is kind of more about um, just formally, what would success be in the abstract? And one way we could define it is that success is just when a goal is attained. Again, that doesn't tell you what goals to take, but just that uh, success as like a dictionary definition would be about um, the attainment of a goal, when a goal is realized or achieved or something like that. And that the, the goal being achieved may not be a matter of individual merit. It could be a matter of luck. It could be a matter of other people's actions, um, things like that. Um, but it might just matter that a certain goal is achieved, and it doesn't matter how it's achieved. Um, here's an example I thought of this afternoon when I was talking with my students. Um, so I have a kid, and there's, a, there's things that I hope for for my child as they're developing. Let's say there's some particular skill that I hope that they learn. And uh, let's say uh, they end up learning it from someone who's not me. Yes. The example. I'm describing it right now. Yes, I have a kid. Oh, okay. So I have a kid, and let's say there's something I hope for for them. Um, like a, a, a type of skill that I hope that they attain. Um, and I'm not the one who ends up teaching them that skill. And I might think, like, as a parent, it's my job to do these things. I want to be a good parent. Um, and I maybe I, in a moment, fe have feelings of, like, oh, I wanted to be the person that taught them that. But that might just be a selfish thought on my part. You know, that's more about me and my ego. Um, and my my identity of, of being Luke's parent and that I might resent another person who took that role away from me or something like that. But if I get past my egoism, if I get past my selfishness here, if I really care about Luke, my child, for his own sake, then all I really care about is that this happens. I want it to happen for him. If it happens, maybe that's the most meaningful, important thing here. And that would be kind of how this first definition of success doesn't depend so much about whether it was through my effort or through my merit that that goal was achieved. But then there's other times that we have a sort of thicker conception of success where we think of the person who achieves the goal as the success. And then there is the link with individual merit. I know for some of you in this class, um, Individual merit is something deeply meaningful to you. Um, it's come up, uh, the, the theme of merit and meritocracies uh, has come up many times over the course of the quarter, but probably it was most explicitly present in the discussion around um, affirmative action. And um, I know for some of you from reading journals and things like that, that that is something that's deeply meaningful to you. That being able to know that you achieved something through your own effort is is more meaningful than just whether it was achieved or not and and it might matter depending on what we're talking about whether um, the individual success is and, and merit is important and significant or whether it's not um, so I, I asked some provocative questions here any reason why we might value one over the other 
Um, and I think there are a lot of arguments here. Uh, it might be easy to say, well, it depends on the circumstances, but we also have some voices in this conversation which say, oh, no, it doesn't. Um, like, there are some people who might say, everything only has meaning in terms of merit. Like, it's all merit. And then there's other voices that would say things like, um, uh, like, like it, it doesn't matter unless you earn it kind of thing. Then there's other voices, I'm thinking specifically of Buddhism. Buddhism is going to show up a few times in this discussion. Uh, Wines brings it up, and I will bring it up too, uh, to elaborate on certain ideas. Um, but Buddhism has a pretty strong argument here, and this is one thing that makes it so countercultural um, as a philosophical movement, is that the Buddhism comes out really strongly in saying, like, that's just a big trap. There is no merit. There is no, uh, there is no, no ego to be attached with this kind of thing. Buddhists would take that kind of analysis that uh, Hedinger made about how uh, you um, you don't deserve your qualifications in as much as all the things that weren't your effort. Buddhism goes further and would say, even your effort is like not your own. You can't lay claim to it. And if you try to, you are going to cause yourself to suffer. Um, and that whole story, I'm not going to go into the whole Buddhism story, but just, I'm just bringing them up as an example that the answer, it depends, would be too quick in this regard because there are extreme positions out there on this issue and those extreme positions are not obviously absurd. They do have arguments to defend themselves. Um, I will be bringing up Buddhism eh, a couple times in this lecture and if, it, if that interests you and you want to talk more about Buddhism, I'm not going to do that in this lecture, but I'd be happy to do it outside of this lecture if you're curious. I always love talking about Buddhism. And, uh, and, and and really, um, Christianity for that matter, too. You know I'm a Buddhist and a Christian. If you want to talk about this discussion in a more theological lens, I'd be happy to do that, too, uh, with you outside of class. But I'm not going to make this into a, a religion lecture. Okay. Um, so, okay, that's good for that. Let's, let's, uh, let's get moving here on the main course, which is these um, models of success that wines labels as being outcome or product models. Um, and maybe maybe I was going to talk about this later, but let's talk about this now. Um, so wines is going to contrast this category with process models of success, not product models, so product versus process. Um, and that is a meaningful distinction. That's another one of these main junctures. Like if you're going to flesh out a vision of meaning of life, this is one of the theoretical choices you'd have to make. Do you want to see meaning in the attainment of a, of a goal, like arriving at a destination, or do you want to see meaning in terms of the process of working toward a goal, regardless of whether it's achieved or not? Like, is, it, is, the, is the meaning of life getting to the goal, or is it the journey getting there kind of thing? And there are um, definitely cases to be made for both. This is another interesting area for debate. Um, it's possible to maybe say both. That's true, too. Um, but the, the big thing that I think Wines gets wrong here, and that I would want to clarify, is that when we're looking through even these um, product models of success, um, all of them could be taken from their product cons uh, articulation um, and turned into a kind of process thing. Even materialism, which is the first one we're going to be looking at. Um, even some, seeing uh, the meaning of life in terms of something like um, the attainment of wealth, you could even think of that as like a process type of meaning. Um, for instance, it might be that you're like, I don't really care about how much money I make. What I care about is the making of the money, right? Or the pursuit of it, um, the competition in the market uh, to, to, to struggle over those resources is the thing of meaning. Um, so that, there's, there's, that, that, and it's a little bit more of a stretch with this one than some of the others, but I think almost all of the product models that uh, Wines identifies have a process version on them. Rather than thinking of these different models of meaning and the objects of value that they involve as being like either process or product, I think really the process product distinction is a twist that you could take on just about any of them. Okay. With that in mind, though, let's actually look at it. Um, okay. 
So I just check something really quick. So the first one we are, we're going to look at here is materialism, or the accumulated wealth model as Wines talks about it. Um, and you've got some examples here, Carnegie, Gates, um, Scrooge McDuck, <laughs> although that's probably a straw man. Um, and um, materialism is, uh, in, a, in there, there are definitely certain embodiments of it that don't seem pretty uh, plausible or compelling as visions for meaning. Uh, I think Wines talks about the sort of like whoever dies with the most toys wins or something like that. That seems pretty meaningless and superficial. Or if I saw it, my whole my whole purpose of life is to get that number in my bank account as high as possible before I die. I mean that seems pretty useless. So for the most part, um, to see wealth uh, or material goods as a sort of end in themselves seems like absurd and n n hard to make a good argument for. But I think there's more charity that we could have toward this model. And um, I, I like the way Wines, Wines is sensitive to this. Um, to like just pursue wealth in a greedy sort of way is a pretty miserable existence when it comes to meaning. But if your goal is to do something like amass a comfortable amount of wealth to enjoy the so-called good things in life, that's a quote from Wines here, um, that sounds uh, a lot more plausible to us and something that we're many times drawn into and maybe not inappropriately so or so the argument might go that it isn't so much the love of money that we're pursuing as much as what we want to do with it and I think in many ways um, valuing money or materialism is in some ways just not an actual answer to the question of the meaning of life because it really just pushes that onto something else. All right? So take for example if uh, I value um, uh, acquiring wealth because I want to support my family and I want them to be able to have a good life. I want to empower them to be able to have a, a life of, of freedom and meaning. Well money is maybe not sufficient to create a meaningful life but it sure seems to be necessary. You got to get a livelihood somehow to be able to survive. And if my if I spend if I have to work 80 hours a week to support my family, and all I do with my life is work to make money, that could be pretty meaningful if it's something I'm doing out of my love for my family or to my friends um, or to uh, charitable donations of the world at large or something like that. I mean. Those are things that might be pretty meaningful, but if we start talking about those objects of meaning, chances are we're going to be getting into one of these other categories instead. Um, so those kinds of ways of defending uh, a preoccupation with material goods is really to value them just as a means for some other end. And whatever that other end is, that's where the meaning is. Now, I think all that is true, but I actually think there is still a useful category here of materialism. And Wines doesn't get into this, but I want to help him out a little bit. And to do that, I'm going to tell you a little tangent story about my favorite Buddhist from the 20th century. Oh, man, I really like Thich Nhat Hanh, and the Dalai Lama is pretty solid, too. I think the one I'm fascinated the most with, though, is this um, man, Chogyam Trungpa, who is not a perfect human being by any stretch of the imagination, but he is a very interesting human being. He was a part of the Tibetan diaspora when... Um, uh, in 1959, China came in and, and the Tibetan exile happened. Um, <clears throat> and he crossed the mountains uh, to try to escape um, the Chinese army. And uh, a lot of people died on the journey over the mountains, but he survived barely and was rescued. And then he went to, um, to Britain and then eventually the United States. And, and he was really the first major... Uh, ambassador of Tibetan Buddhism to America and to the West. Um, so he's he's in the 60s is is when he was doing a lot of his stuff. And so he's a very traditional Tibetan Buddhist monk, um, very well trained, uh, very knowledgeable, and is trying to teach Westerners about Buddhism. And there's a lot of enthusiasm for this. This is the 60s, you know, and and the hippies and everything. And there's a lot of people who are already feeling like the, the postmodern world is one of nihilism and the emptiness of capitalism and materialism and, and 
people are looking for spiritual meaning and, and all this kind of stuff to like fill that void, of an alternative. And Buddhism and Eastern spirituality looks pretty attractive to, to some uh, segments of the American population. And so Trungpa's got no shortage of people who are interested in hanging out with him. Um, uh, in fact, you'll probably recognize some names. Allen Ginsberg is a really famous one. Um, David Bowie. Um, there are a lot of people, and not all famous people, too. But um, Trungpa is trying to kind of teach Americans traditional Buddhism, um, and he finds that uh, there's a kind of major problem that he starts noticing, where Americans are like taking all the teachings and you know kind of absorbing Buddhism and its doctrines and its practices and meditation and all this kind of stuff, but it's getting all twisted up in ways that really disturb Trungpa. And he ends up having kind of a crisis about it. And he leaves America. I think, I don't know if he goes to Thailand or, um, I can't, I can't, maybe Thailand. But he, he goes back to Asia, not back to Tibet, of course, but um, he goes back to Asia and stays at a monastery. He kind of takes a sabbatical where he meditates on this problem. And he's thinking about, like, what is he doing? Because America is a totally different culture. He does end up getting a degree um, from a, a British university. I can't remember which one. Maybe Cambridge. Um and sort of uh, assimilates into uh, Western culture, even so much uh, to go so far as to renounce his monk vows. He marries someone, and he really tries to integrate into Western culture, but to bring this very traditional Buddhism in there. And um, and but he's like, I, you know, am I getting something wrong here? Am I misunderstanding something about American culture? What's happening? And then he's like, Oh, I get it. I see what's happening. And this is when he comes up with his idea of spiritual materialism. So this is a long tangent, but I promise it's going somewhere. <laughs> um, Trungpa picked out, and th th I'm talking about this at length because I think it's one of the coolest ideas. I've been very influenced by this in my own philosophy. It actually motivated some papers I wrote um, and some of my own original work. But this idea of spiritual materialism is that materialism is not a matter of valuing material objects. But it actually goes deeper than that. And that's where I think there is still a meaningful category here of meaning that we could call a materialistic model of meaning. The model of meaning is whatever the objects are, that the way we treat something as valuable is only if it is in our life. If it's a part of my little circle of how I identify myself and what I think, at least, I possess. So like what Trungpa was noticing in these American students of Buddhism is that they were really just looking to get something out of Buddhism. They wanted to acquire enlightenment. They wanted to acquire wisdom. They wanted to acquire spiritual power um, and, and, and credit themselves with it. And this is what was disturbing Trungpa as a Buddhist, as a good Buddhist, is that there's a lot of egoic activity going on with that. Um, and that he was worried he was leading everyone into hell <laughs> by having them pursue enlightenment in an unenlightened way, um, to treat enlightenment itself as if it was a material good to acquire. Um, so he, he was sort of recognizing that with the cultural backdrop of American consumerism and materialism, that when Americans were, when they had Buddhist ideas and values put in front of them, they were relating to those things in the same model that they had learned to be related to material things. Um, and that's not uh, maybe a good thing. I mean, there's there's room here for being very... Trump is obviously very critical of this. I share that criticism in all honesty. But you do see this model of meaning all over the place, even when it doesn't have to do with material wealth or material possessions. Um, some really low-hanging fruit examples here would be like, well, uh, Facebook's a good example, like just accumulating friends um, or likes or stuff like that. Or or like sometimes I, I, I'm off Facebook, thank God, I've been off it for a decade, um, but my partner's still on it and so I still, and I'm, it's impossible to avoid Facebook entirely. Um, but you look at some people's Facebook feeds and it's kind of like they're trying to catalog all these meaningful moments and experiences that they've had in their life. I think that's the more insidious example, where we treat 
valuable experiences or meaningful experiences as another commodity that we want in our lives. So in other words, I might want to have some money so I can travel the world and have meaningful experiences or go to concerts uh, or have conversations with people. And I don't value the conversation necessarily for like the wisdom it brings to me or how it changes my perspective or the relational aspect of it, but just that I can like file it away in my little photo book of meaningful things that have happened to Tim that I can, you know, my precious, you know, kind of like I I can say, look at all the all the meaningful things I've done in my life, this kind of thing. Um, that does smell of materialism, I think, and um, I, I think it's something we can we can be worried about. Um, or even even before Facebook, I mean, Facebook wasn't the first time that people did this, but things like uh, maybe you've met people who kind of seem to collect friends, right? And it's not so much about valuing that person or valuing the relationship, but just that they are their friend. It's like a name in their book kind of thing that they've acquired, um, that kind of stuff. Certainly, materialism is a big risk in the intellectual community, in academia. I've seen it a lot in a lot of my colleagues, um, that there is this temptation to treat wisdom itself as a possession to be acquired, and you get greedy for it and stuff like that. So I think, I think it's good. I've, I've been talking at length about materialism here, but I think that's because there's a much deeper level to how to think about this model of meaning and that it shows up a lot in a lot of places otherwise you might not think. Um, I personally, in being a part of religious traditions, I've seen um, not just in like Trungpa's example with Buddhism, but certainly in Christianity, I've seen highly materialistic models of meaning applied to spiritual objects. Um, and I think that is not what Christianity is about personally, uh, but um, we have a debate about that too. But um, materialism is not as simple as just the love of money. And um, you might be materialistic in ways that um, you might not recognize if you only think about it in terms of, well, I'm not greedy. I don't need a lot of money. But there might be other ways in which this is actually the model of meaning. Um, I'd say, just to kind of put a final note on this, if there's a concern about this that I've been articulating, a concern about materialism, it's that in order for me to recognize something as valuable, it must be a part of my life. And that kind of way in which materialism is in reference to the self um, or to the ego is, I think, the thing of potential concern. To cash that out in a full argument of why would you, why should you be concerned about things that are connected with the self or selfishness or ego or something like that, that's a longer discussion. I'd probably give a lot of Buddhism about that, the Buddhist story about that. Um, but uh, I think that's where the debate would go. So again, this whole lecture is really just the start of conversations but um, and not following them through to their conclusion. But if you want to talk about that with me outside of class sometime, let's do it. I'd love to. Okay. Um, I'm coming up on an hour here, so I think... This might be a good time for me to take a short break. I'm getting a little lightheaded from talking so much, so that's always when I know it's time for a break. So come back here, and we'll finish up the rest of these. All right, so getting back into it here. Um, the, the next few... Um, models of meaning are going to be kind of related to each other. So there, um, some of the language that would be involved with these models you might be familiar with and in fact um, might even think of them as being kind of almost the same. And there are some pretty, some of them are kind of subtle distinctions between them, but I feel like those distinctions are actually pretty significant ones uh, in terms of thinking about different ways of being related to meaning. So um, Let's, uh, let's be careful about it, and I'll try to do my best to identify what those differences are and why, why they are significant. So the next one that uh, Wines talks about, and I think he's kind of a big fan of, is this Emersonian or Mensch model. Um, Emerson is a, a famous uh, New England transcendentalist from 19th century in America um, and has had a very, say, pretty big uh, impact on American culture and the American mindset, especially in as much as there's a kind of spiritual dimension to American culture. Emerson captures a lot of that, I think. I, I really enjoy reading Emerson. I think he's a very interesting um, thinker. Just one second. My 
has gone down, so I want to see more light. I'm squinting really hard. Um, yeah, Emerson's a very interesting person, and, and in some ways he's very much in the Aristotelian tradition. And I, and I think Aristotle is probably one of the best um, frames of reference for us in understanding this model of meaning, mostly because we studied him at length earlier this quarter. Um, but remember for Aristotle, being an excellent human being, um, being an ideal human being, like a, a kind of a goal to be shooting for of excellence, was really a matter of exhibiting all of the um, important abilities of what it is to be human in an excellent way. And that's that's where uh, I think that's the right way to cash out phrases like um, success on this model, a successful life is a, a life lived that was fully human, um, to be fully human kind of thing. Um, there's uh, the, the, the way in which Aristotle is thinking about performing these different functions of being a human being excellently is like engaging with those aspects of what it is to be a person. Um, maybe the Emersonian or Mensch model doesn't require these things to be um, uh, done to the height of excellence. Like maybe they're not quite as intense on that. Certain versions of this model might not be as intense as Aristotle is about it. Um, but definitely it would be in this kind of category that you're participating with what it means to be human, not just in some places, but all over the map. Like in all the basic, uh, the many basic ways in which there are components or facets to human life. Um, a really good um, uh, reflection of this kind of model of meaning actually comes from a liberal arts college curriculum. Uh, the whole philosophy behind liberal arts colleges is that you're not just going to be a specialist about one thing, but that to be a, a well-rounded person or to have this kind of meaningful life means being exposed to a lot of different things too. So you're not just an artist or just an engineer or just an accountant or just whatever philosopher but that you're you're um, even if you're not an expert you're at least a student of these other things to the point where uh, um, the I mean the being the student I guess the education only matters to just acquaint you with that so with the idea that then you're um, awake to this kind of aspect of what it is to be human and you can make build that into your conception of your life and what you value and pursue and appreciate um, and that's definitely in this kind of Emersonian or Mensch model. Um, there, this is going to be a little bit more individualistic. Uh, it's a matter of you being fully human kind of thing, right? Um, it could be that you become valuable. So this is about uh, character traits like Aristotle is thinking. Um, that uh, you are a valuable person for ex exhibiting all these kinds of qualities. Or uh, that your life is a valuable one. And that might be similar to Aristotle's idea of the excellent life, right? And maybe we could put more focus on the excellent life and less on the, the person living that life. Um, but those are kind of two options for how this could be cashed out. By the way, I think it, it, re, it bears, this is a good time to bring this up. Um, and this was similar to some things we talked about with Aristotle when, when I presented him earlier in the quarter. Having a meaningful life doesn't necessarily mean that you... Uh, need to have a meaningful life to be for your life to be of value, especially from a moral perspective. Um, it's not as though if you're not fully human, then you don't fully deserve human rights or something like that. I mean, most of the people I've um, talked with or read, like Emerson, who advance this kind of model of meaning, are not thinking of it as an excuse to be an elitist about certain people or something like that or that we only need to be concerned with people who are the best. Some people think that way. The, uh, Nietzsche is pretty prominent here. I put him on the list um, of examples of thinkers or people who fit into this kind of model. Um, but that's not something that the model is intrinsically connected with. And I'd say Nietzsche is definitely an outlier here when it comes to that. This, so this doesn't have to be aristocratic is another way to put it. Um, there's another... Um, um, Another frame of reference that might be useful. You know I like Star Trek. I already brought it up once tonight already, I think, if I remember right. Um, if you do, if Star Trek is a frame of reference for you, um, then uh, you'll know that every, every single Star Trek series that's ever been made always has 
one character that I describe as the Emerson character. Um, it, whether that's Mr. Spock in the original series, or Data in the Next Generation, or Odo in Deep Space Nine, uh, or Seven of Nine in uh, Voyager. There's always some character in the in the Star Trek series who is trying to understand what it means to be human, either because they aren't human, um, or because maybe their humanity has been lost, or they're, they uh, are something alien or different. Um, and they're, they're trying to understand this whole human thing and what it means to be human. Data is probably the purest example, because he's a android uh, who is trying to learn how to become human. So the whole his whole journey is one of trying to understand the human equation kind of thing. And a lot of what he's doing is trying to understand these different aspects or parts of what it means to be to have a human life. Seven of Nine in Voyager is a human, but who has uh, had her humanity destroyed because of a profound violation um, mentally, physically, and uh, existentially. And she's trying to recover her humanity, and that's part of her arc as a character, um, to like relearn this. Um, so, if you don't know Star Trek, don't worry about it. I'm not going to talk too much more about it. But um, a lot of existentialism is in this kind of category, too, because existentialists uh, are really concerned with living a life of sincerity or being a life of freedom or especially an authentic life. If you've ever had questions about that, I've talked about that with uh, way back at the beginning of the quarter with the anxieties of non-being and meaninglessness. Um, and something like... Uh, is my life my own? Uh, are the values I have things that I've actually sincerely created and endorse, or have they been chosen for me? Is society controlling me in some sort of way, or my parents, or my culture, or whatever? Um, and that desire to live an authentic human life, one that's not full of lies and deceit or confabulation or bias, is uh, very much connected here with this kind of Emersonian model. Okay, but it, one big thing to point out is that it does tend to be individualistic. I think it's interesting thinking with all these models about how individualistic are they. Um, the next model, though, is going to really strongly contrast with that the individualism of the Emerson model. And that's this sainthood or universalizing faith model. Um, it might involve enlightenment. Um, Col well, I'll talk about Kohlberg here in a second. Um, some examples, Gandhi, Mother Teresa, Martin Luther King junior, um, people like this. The, the, the big way in which this model is constructing a vision of a successful life has to do with some kind of spiritual or moral goal. Um, and there could be a lot of, I say here, could be a lot of personal effort involved, um, but this is not like the Emersonian or Mensch model because it has no notion of personal accomplishment really. Um, I, uh, I said these answers tend to revolve around the image of service, but in many ways, I think the best way to define this model and what makes it distinct as sort of a family of visions of meaning is that it's all about um, the not-self. It's all about whether, whether my life is meaningful or whether it's a successful life has to do with my participation in something that's um, bigger than me, that's uh, outside of me, potentially but it would maybe involves me. It's sort of inside me too, but really the, the successful life here is a matter of my ability to connect and participate with this other sort of thing. So for example, think about um, the contrast between someone who uh, volunteers at a soup kitchen or something um, for uh, helping to get meals to people who are experiencing homelessness. Um, imagine if they do that because that's what a good person would do. Right? That that's what a virtuous person would do. That would be more like the Emersonian or Mensch model of meaning. Right, Same action. Very different meaning, though. As opposed to someone who does it uh, out of or is motivated or um, understands the value of that choice in terms of there are people who need help and I can help them and I want to make that good happen. Um, it's not about me. It's about the good to be done. The some, something that's outside of me. Um, com the compassion for what's going on with somebody else. It's not about me and the compassion I'm feeling. That's putting the attention of meaning in the wrong place according to this model. This would be about putting the meaning out there. And my life is meaningful not for its own sake, not in a, like a, a spiritual materialistic kind of way, 
but for my ability to participate with a meaning that's much bigger than what is sort of the little sphere of my personal life. Um, so this is a this is a, a pretty profoundly different way of thinking about meaning too, and this is the one where I was thinking you know uh, religious um, models of meaning generally sit not always and again there's a lot of diversity of models of meaning that can happen within a tradition like I was mentioning earlier, but on paper like you might say theologically or philosophically most religious traditions are are presenting something like this so. It could be um, participating in God, um, with God, in relationship with God, or God's plan for the world, um, or the the vision of God's will. That might be the kind of thing that's bigger than me, that my life is meaningful in terms of my participation with it. Um, but it could also be like a moral ideal, like justice, which is bigger than any one person. Um, or their actions that are just or unjust or something like that, the focus is on the justice itself or the compassion or um, the enlightenment or something like that. Um, in some ways, uh, the pursuit of wisdom, a life that uh, is pursuing wisdom is kind of like this too because knowledge is not, um, you know, knowledge is something you're seeking. You're seeking to understand something that isn't you. Um, I mean, it could involve you. I mean, there's ways in which we are distanced from ourselves, right? And if I want to understand what I truly am, it's not just a matter of what I say I am, um, but it might be a matter of some interesting self-exploration. I might discover who I am. Uh, it may not be something that's um, just a matter of my choice or something like that. Um, uh, again, not to, uh, or not again, but I wouldn't want to confuse what I just said with something like, the meaningful choices that we make with respect to ourselves. I'm just saying that there is a whole world inside of us that is bigger than what appears on the surface and um, we might discover aspects of ourselves that are dormant or hidden um, and even that would be a kind of truth seeking at a horizon of something that's outside of where I currently sit in my understanding or in my opinion and I want to understand that. It's like my I am like an object that I'm seeking to understand, like another person that I want to deeply understand. If I'm going to listen to them, my attention needs to be focused on them, not on me and my listening or something, right? So maybe you're getting the sense here for how this model is a different one, how it's finding meaning um, by participating in something greater. Okay, um, so uh, Fowler is also kind of interesting here. Fowler is bringing in more of the religious component, but he's really a derivative of Kohlberg. He's very inspired by Kohlberg. Let's talk about Kohlberg first. Um, some of you may have heard of Kohlberg. He is a psychologist, developmental psychologist, uh, very famous, um, very controversial, uh, and whether you agree or disagree with his theories, um, I, I think it's worth studying him. He, he might be wrong, but if he's wrong, he's interestingly wrong. And maybe something that's not quite like his theory, but something close to it, uh, might be a way of thinking about meaning here as well. Kohlberg, though, to, for his part, so with granted that there's controversy around this. Um, Kohlberg uh, did some empirical studies that again are challenged <laughs> like everything in science but um, and especially in psychology, in empirical psychology. Uh, but he, he, he did, this isn't just out of his head, he just came up with this. It's, it, it is the product of interviews that he had with children, some actual research that he did. But he found that there were some patterns to uh, development uh, in terms of what kind of relationship people have to morality. And I've given a supplement that's on Canvas. I check I check it out. It's pretty cool. I'm not going to go through all of it right here. But he basically sees, he charts out this kind of linear progression of people's m maturity with respect to the moral realm. And at the beginning, it's pretty egoistic um, or, or legalistic that uh, there's a stage of moral relativism <laughs> that he puts in there pretty early on. Um, that morality is just maybe a power struggle or it's this kind of negotiation that happens, maybe something like a social contract, or it's just about making people happy. And then eventually, though, Kohlberg says stage six is something very different. And actually, later in his life, he was like, I'm not sure stage six is something people ever achieve. And he thought that because he, he became more skeptical that it would be empirically recognizable. He thinks it's still possible for humans but it may not be something that you could prove someone's at, which is sort of interesting but uh, in itself. But this, uh, this sixth uh, stage of moral development 
is when an individual cares about morality for its own sake, not for personal aims or some other kind of social benefit like reward or punishment, um, and resolves moral dilemmas by adopting a universal perspective. This, if this sounds familiar, it should. It sounds a lot like Kant uh, or Rawls. Rawls is kind of updating of Kant. Um, that and and there's been a lot of accusations that Kohlberg is biased by Kantian thinking or theory or something like that. But it, it's sort of interesting that this is maybe um, another the, that the the Kantian picture of a moral life is itself a model of meaning and a successful life in total, um, and it involves. Uh, caring about the right thing, doing the right thing because it is the right thing and nothing else. No bribery, no ulterior motives, nothing about like how I see myself as a person, like personal virtue or something like that. But you just do something for the sake of it being the good thing to do. You care about justice because it's for the sake of justice. You care about other people for their own sake. Just, and that's it. So this is this almost involves a kind of ego loss itself, I think, um, that I'm I'm not thinking about life in terms of a negotiation of self and other, but it's like I'd care for anyone um, in this sort of way, in a in a universal sort of way. And the universal part is also that's why he calls it universalizing faith model, is that this kind of um, model of meaning um, does not judge people based on their usefulness or something like that, um, but really moves outside of a tribal way of approaching life. Um, at, at its extreme end, um, it's this kind of attempt to participate in a universal type of moral ideal or concern. Okay. Next up is another um, psychologist is going to be relevant here, Maslow, with this idea of self-actualization. Uh, and this one is very easy to mix up with two, I think. Um, this is probably the closest one uh, to what's going on here. Um, so there might be a lot of things I'm about to say that sound familiar from the Emerson model, but there's going to be a big twist on this that makes it different. Um, by the way, sort of a background here. Let me see if I can pull it up. Um, I've got it. This was also in the uh, supplements on Canvas that were optional. Um, but you may have heard of Maslow's hierarchy before. It's a It's a kind of linear progression of people's needs and uh, Maslow's thesis was that uh, you a person is going to be preoccupied with meeting the needs the unmet needs that are on the bottom end of this this pyramid diagram um, and that they're they have limited ability to entertain or work on uh, any of the needs or values that kind of go up the pyramid if the bottom ones are un, unmet or unresolved so the kind of at the bottom, you've just got like the basic necessities of survival. And then from there, it kind of moves up like maybe sto social, economic stability, contin uh, circumstantial stability, uh, relationships, um, love and belonging, he says, and then self-esteem, confidence, achievement, ambition, respect. Uh, and then at the top, he has self-actualization, which he includes things like morality, creativity, spontaneity, problem solving, lack of prejudice, acceptance of facts. Some of the higher ideals of human endeavor show up here. Again, this might sound a lot like Aristotle and performing functions excellently, but the thing that um, Maslow sort of brings to this idea of self-actualization that makes it a little different and, and what categorizes this model of the meaning of life different from the other ones, uh, especially the Emerson model, is that this self-actualization might be unique and contingent to each person. So whereas the, the, the Emerson model or the Aristotelian model is this thing about like being fully human, that there are these like potentials of humanity in the abstract or universal that you're trying to participate with, um, that everyone participates with or could participate with, this way of um, realizing uh, ideals of humanity might be tailored individually to you. So the, I, like the, I think the best way to put this would be that this model of meaning sees success in the realization of one's potential or to be all one can be or something like that or, or maybe a more contemporary catchphrase is be your best self, something like that. And that might mean a little bit more introspection and self-discovery, um, the ability to find what it is that you have locked within you and to realize that to the best of your ability. Uh, different people might have different potentials here. 
and the self-actualization model doesn't see that as particularly relevant. What's relevant is what's going on with you and what you make out of your life and the person that you are. Uh, and that might be unique. Okay, so um, definitely uh, probably even more individualistic than the, even the Emerson model was. Um, so that, that's, a, that's another way that we might think about meaning. Um, another thing that kind of has to do with the individual, um, although it's interesting this shows up in so-called collectivist cultures as much as individualistic cultures, um, but it's this, this hero-heroine model. And this one's a little tricky to explain. There's another cool big idea that shows up here. Um, Joseph Campbell wrote this book called The Hero with a Thousand Faces. Very, very interesting book. Um, Campbell's an anthropologist and sociologist and historian. And he did a, a survey of all these different stories from different cultures across the planet and, a, and through time. And he found, especially like mythological stories and things like that, and he was like, there's a pattern. There's a pattern to all of these. They all kind of follow the same narrative arc to them. Um, which he calls the hero's journey. And it has these six stages to it. Uh, uh, not to do too much science fiction here, but it, it, Star Wars maybe is, it's a little more, um, people are a little more aware of Star Wars than Star Trek, uh, so it might land with more of you. Um, but uh, if you watch the original Star Wars trilogy, it just follows this to a T. Um, and and there are and th this is, again this is just not restricted to just Western cultures but it happens all over the place all these different stories that get told with figures um, there's this call to adventure or vocation uh, or actually when I go through this here let let's let's step back for a second so the model of meaning that's going on here why how is this useful for a, a meaning of life theory it's basically to say that the meaning of your life comes from the narrative or the story of your journey through life. And it's playing playing out that story and meeting with success in that story that is what makes for the successful life. So again, this could could get wrapped up into things like um, the Emersonian model. It, this could be like a, maybe a more specific version of it in that this, is, uh, this journey is what it means to be human. You don't have to necessarily put that on there. But definitely these kinds of models for what a life ought to look like uh, are definitely guiding, action guiding, uh, and give us a vision for what to do with our life, how to see purpose in it, and what choices to make. So I actually, better than Star Wars, um, let's relate the, these different steps to something that I think might be pretty familiar to you. And that's this model of how society sort of lays out a plan for uh, a successful person in that society. And, and the details will differ from culture to culture, but Many of them uh, I bear a lot of the same earmarks here. Uh, let's let's just do it kind of from like an American thing. Um, but I, I think this could overlap with a lot of other cultures too. But um, how would how would this kind of have you maybe felt like your life kind of there's a momentum of how society wants you to participate in things and even counter cultural figures which we might uh, turn into heroes and heroines. Um, they they also kind of will still sh follow the same pattern very often. Um, but there might be a call to adventure or a vocation. So that might be like a dream you have when you're a kid about what you want to be when you grow up. Um, or maybe your life circumstances throw something at you that uh, you become aware of something that you're like, oh, I need to do something about that. Or maybe it's, maybe it's that class you take at school one time with that teacher or something that um, like brightens your interest or awakens a passion or something like that. But there's some sort of call that draws you from the home life that you grow up in, the kind of the world of your home with your family or caregivers, whoever that is, and, and then brings you out into the larger, wider world after, as you are maturing into an adult. Um, and then there's some kind of unsuspected, usually supernatural aid that comes to one who undertakes his or her proper adventure. Now, in storytelling, this will happen like Harry Potter or something like that, uh, or Star Wars with the Force. Um, or in some kind of spiritual uh, matter in in um, in spiritual story uh, religious stories, um, but if we're relating this to like the real life scenario I'm I'm trying to play with here, it would be something like maybe um, maybe something that happens to you in school, like a mentor or a discovering an ability 
um, or uh, that you have an aptitude for something, um, or that there's an opportunity that you're given, a special opportunity. Um, maybe it's like that uh, scholarship that you get, or you get into some some school you didn't think you could get into. Um, it could be like like for young athletes. It could be like getting drafted really high, and a and a school gives you the or a team professional sports team gives you some opportunity or something like that. Any some kind of like intervention that isn't anticipated, but kind of gives the the hero this support for the adventure that they're going on. Um, maybe it's like a book you read that you encounter that like changes your life or unlocks something, empowers you in some sort of way. This is a little different from the call to adventure, like the thing that awakens your awareness of a goal to attempt. Uh, this is more like receiving a kind of aid in support for that attempt. The crossing of the thir first threshold would be like the first sort of success or your first entry into this thing that you're you're gearing up to do. It might be like that first job you get out of college. Um, it could be like um, it could be getting accepted into a graduate program. Um, it could be um, maybe maybe like in the sports thing, like some major sports accomplishment that happens to you. But there there's some sort of um, stage of initiation, and you meet with some like initial success, right? And there so there's like upside, right, <laughs> or, or like hope, or like you're like, oh, I can do this. And then you're confronted with some sort of challenge. Um, maybe this is this would be like the Empire Strikes Back version of the Star Wars story. Um, it'd be like maybe um, you you have some setback, like you get fired from a job that you were you were really that was like a special opportunity or something, um, or like you're in graduate school and you go to a conference and give a paper and it doesn't go well or something like that or or there's a professor that really doesn't like you or um, or you apply for schools and get rejected um, there's some some sort of setback that causes the hero or you to like lose faith in your dream or challenges that faith it causes you to doubt it of like, can I really do this? Am I gonna? Am I? Am I really able to make it or not? There's a lot of doubt and uncertainty in this phase, and then that becomes overcome, uh, and you are victorious in your dream. You realize your dream, something like that, and uh, you are successful um, in the business world. It might be like you know, you, your company is taking off, or you start a new company, or something. You own your own company. Maybe that's the dream, something like that. And then you retire, and then you you go back to the home life. You know you're you're returning back to um, from the adventure, and it's no adventures anymore, kind of thing. Um, for those Lord of the Rings fans out there, the Grey Havens, right? That kind of thing. Um, or Bilbo's return to Rivendell. I'm a I'm a Lord of the Rings nerd too, in, in case you're wondering. And this is kind of the like. The, the chart of, of life in a, in a capitalistic uh, in, in American context would be kind of like you your success is you're financially, economically successful and you've got a 401k and everything and then you get to live off of that and enjoy your retirement and that's the end of your life and there's no longer ambition that you're really getting into but it's sort of like it cools down at the end of life, right? In the twilight, twilight years. Okay, so this might be a model. You may have felt like you, you're being pushed along to play into this model. And I think that might be maybe one of the bigger downsides to this model of meaning um, is that it, it might be too constraining um, and that not everyone's circumstances uh, enable this to happen, or at least not to happen in the way that's culturally dominant, right? Uh, the culturally dominant version of this narrative. So like I was mentioning earlier, Sometimes people will kind of do a countercultural rebellion, but many times that also bears the same shape. You know, I think that's what Joseph Campbell would say. Um, the passage into the realm of the night might be something like, I can't, uh, or maybe it'd be something, the call to adventure would be like the, the dominant cultural values and the structure of society doesn't work for me. There, I need to do something different. And maybe you just had that thought. You don't know what to put to it yet. But that's still the call to adventure, right? To 
to head off into the adventuring, risky territory of bucking the trend, doing something countercultural, um, maybe even at great risk to yourself, uh, as happens for too many people who are countercultural in this, uh, in in cultures that are intolerant of their being and position or circumstances. And then they maybe get some help. They meet with some initial success. They might get a lot of blowback from society and be threatened, but they can overcome it and make make out a life for themselves that is stable and works for them and this kind of thing. And then they've accomplished that. And then so so uh, it's it's kind of hard to escape this model in many ways. I think it's worth asking the question: What would make this narrative meaningful? Um, and Wines doesn't really get into that in the paper. Um, I think that's, I'm not going to get into a, it too much here either. But I think that's worth asking because um, Joseph Campbell would say, well, it's just sort of a fact of humanity and our history that all these diverse cultures come in different circumstances all sort of landed on this model. Um, and it's been uh, a guide to people. Um, it's given them direction for finding meaning in life. Um, why would it do that? What would make it compelling? Why these things? Is it just a feature of how we are born when we live and then we die? Is it that our lives are kind of bookended in these ways with birth and death? Um, you know, what, what to think of this? So um, I'm not going to try to give all the answers to that right now. But I, I think if this is going to be a substantive vision of meaning that you'd actually want to apply and use in your life, there's still burden of proof here too. The fact that it's universal or common among cultures wouldn't be itself a justification. That's just a descriptive claim, not a normative one. Um, so I think that's worth thinking about. Um, also, two other models here. I, well, okay, this one we can do pretty quickly. The biological or genetic success model is really just saying you're you've lived a successful life if you have engendered children. <laughs> that's it. Uh, you've participated in the evolutionary uh, game of humanity perpetuating itself through the eons. Uh, I don't know why this would be a very compelling model for meaning. There's a lot of things that are concerning about it. One, it just looks pretty superficial and ignores a whole lot of life. Two, not everyone has access to this. Um, either because... Uh, they are uh, infertile, or they don't choose to to uh, have children. Um, if they're a, like same sex sex couple, um, they are not going to have children. Um, they, I mean, you, there's other things that can be done. You can do surrogate child uh, um, test tube sort of stuff, right? You can do those sorts of things. But there's a major question here about um, like are those are people who either can't or don't participate with this, have they lived unsuccessful or meaningless lives? That just doesn't seem plausible to me. Even if through modern technology, everyone could participate in this. I mean, uh, maybe you heard on the news recently, they were able to create a successful, uh, they're uh, successfully able to create um, a viable embryo with three people's genetic material instead of just two. I mean, there, there's ways that we could do this, but Think about all the people who lived before we had this kind of technology. Are there are, like people who were naturally infertile that we couldn't do anything about it through technology? Are their lives just meaningless because they weren't able to pass on their genetic material? I mean, this just doesn't seem very plausible. So I don't want to say too much more about that. But other than to say that there have been times in history where the, there's been a lot of significance that's been put on this, um, and one would be seen as successful for having lots of children. Um, there might be some other ways to, and I actually I do think that there are other ways to see having children as part of a meaningful life. Um, it's very easy to kind of plug that into an Emersonian model. If we're saying like um, part of what it can mean to be human is to have children and especially like to raise them. It's not just the having of them. That's the other thing that seems goofy to me about this model. Um, um, you know, like many times uh, uh, at times in history, it's been like a part of masculine identity to be like a successful male is to just create children, but not necessarily to be rearing them or have a positive relationship with them, like as a father or something like that, 
right? Just the having of them is what was successful. It just doesn't seem right. But um, there are other ways in which uh, a child um, having children and rearing them could definitely have a role to play in making life a meaningful one um, that could plug into a lot of these other models. But that's kind of where I think it would come down to. It wouldn't just be about the passing of your genetic material, but it would be about uh, these other uh, visions of meaning and value. And then finally, we've got this competitive model, the top of the heap model. And this finds success through winning. And specifically in the sense of there uh, to be a winner, there must be a loser. So kind of demonstrating superiority. I say usually this is specialized, and Aristotle might have some things to say about that. But the goal is to like be the best at something, to be exemplary, and that makes you more meaningful. Um, may, or makes your life more meaningful, perhaps. Um, I, I guess, I think, my quick answer to this, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this one either, but the question is, what makes that meaningful? Um, certainly, the emphasis on competition that happens in capitalism definitely bleeds out into our culture more generally. And it's very possible for us to see this as something meaningful in and of itself, and I, and I think that that might be sort of the same kind of danger is what can happen with materialism. Um, one of the students who was presenting, did their present student presentation on wines today, um, was sort of presenting the idea that under a capitalist society, and this is kind of coming from wines too, under a capitalist society, the way to create a livelihood for survival that um, enables everything else that you might want to do with meaning in life um, requires you to play the competitive game of capitalism. But by doing that, it might become hard for people who live under capitalism to be able to separate out in their minds and in how they think about meaning and value, valuing money as a means, just a necessary means that enables other things like Aristotle's resources that enable excellence, versus it being an end in itself, as having some kind of intrinsic value. And, and I, I, I would... I would say I definitely see this as part of the cultural influence of capitalism. Capitalism isn't just an economic system, but it's it's going to bleed into cultural values and how people see themselves and success itself. Um, I've I, I think it is possible, and I think I've encountered or or read about or sort of known that people there there have been humans that have existed like this in capitalist societies that don't even really care about the money. It's just about the winning. It's just about demonstrating your power, and that's the thing that's more meaningful. I think um, one thing that's left off of this list as a model of meaning is power itself. I kind of wish it was included, but it might go in this category. If I had to put it somewhere without creating its own category, I probably would put it here. That maybe the way in which we might, like power is something we might desire again as a means, like money. Um, but it could also be an end in itself, and, I, and I've definitely met some people who think of power as an end in itself. Nietzsche is actually, that's the way he cashes out the Emerson Mensch model, is uh, will to power. That's Nietzsche's fam famous phrase. Um, I definitely met some people who think of power as just an intrinsic good, and that their life is successful by overcoming obstacles and other people and demonstrating their power. Um, kind of might start sounding like megaloman... megaloman I'm not going to be able to say this word. Megalomaniacal? Um... But uh, that is, that's definitely, I, I wouldn't consider it as a very viable or plausible or persuasive model of meaning, but it definitely is one that shows up, kind of like the biological success model. We, it, it's, it's, going, it's an idea that people have in their heads, um, and that does influence them in how they navigate life. Um, and I think it has to be addressed and thought about, too, and, and what its problems are. Um, I don't think that power in itself make, can make a life meaningful. But that's my two cents. Maybe I should have turned my hat on that one. Okay. So these are all the different models that uh, Wines talks about as the product models. Again, like I said earlier, I think you can do process versions of all of these. That it's not necessarily about this attainment as much as working toward that goal. And that might be the thing that's meaningful. Certainly, I think the sainthood or universalizing faith model, especially as it exists in many religious traditions, uh, it is the pursuit of something that is ultimately unattainable. Um, 
and the the journey of it could be uh, the important part. Kind of like, especially if you're thinking about it, not just in religious terms, but also in just the moral terms. Like I've said many times before, moral theories give you an ideal. They don't necessarily say that it's achievable, but we can make progress toward it. That might be something achievable, and that effort of moving in that direction might be the thing that's meaningful. Uh, I think I said at some point earlier in this quarter that any moral theory that's actually attainable, I'm deeply suspicious of. I'm like, I'm not sure that's really the ultimate ideal if we could actually do it. Um, that the deepest values might be exactly the kinds of things that can't be achieved, but that doesn't mean everything is meaningless. So you could run the process thing on all this stuff if you wanted to. So the things that Wines puts in the process category, I actually think are not uh, restricted just to that process. I think many times kind of the opposite thing is happening here where he is identifying um, product sorts of things, things that could be attainable potentially. And like I say in my lecture notes, I'm I'm not as impressed by Wine's work in this section. I don't think it's as insightful in the categories. I think he puts some big ideas on the table though, and I think that's what's useful. And I'm going to draw out some of these. This lecture is getting long, so I'm, I'll try to make this short. But I definitely think Wine's comments are more convoluted in this section and um, not as clear cut. I mean, what's really useful about this is you get like really discrete theoretical divisions of different models of meaning. And here it starts to get all mixed up a little bit. But I really like this idea of the inward outward distinction. I think that is a useful one. Uh, another kind of one of these like you could make a choice this way or this way. I don't think that this is a different idea. I think this is another continuum of, of like a theoretical choice and meaning that's already shown up in the in the diversity of the product, what he called the product models of meaning. Um, but probably the best way to describe this idea would be through the lens of Buddhism. So, uh, and I, I'll, I'll promise I'll keep this tangent short. Buddhism looks it, it's its major motivation philosophically is the existence of suffering. Suffering, people suffer, that's a problem. Um, that that problematizes life. Suffering problematizes life. And we're not talking about pain here or misfortune. When Buddhism talks about suffering, um, I think the best definition that we could give for it uh, philosophically would be something like, if you are suffering, you're adopting an attitude about life that it is intolerable. If I'm suffering about something, it's like I'm taking this attitude where I'm saying, if life is like this, fuck life. Can't be a part of it. Like Kind of like a, a despair, although uh, despair is actually something that can be suffered well. Uh, the, in other words, it wouldn't constitute this kind of definition of suffering, I think. But that's a, that's a whole other thing about despair. Um, I could talk about that sometime if you want me to. If you want to talk about despair, let me know. It's a major topic of interest for me. Um, but uh, there, suffering, you could suffer about anything. Um, Hume famously says, it's not outside of the realm of human possibility. He's talking about the basic irrationality of humans, that we would prefer the destruction of the entire world to the scratching of our pinky finger. <laughs> so, I mean, sometimes very small things can cause us to suffer. Uh, but it, does, it isn't always physical pain. It can be emotional, and it can even be what we might want to call spiritual. Um, a kind of anguish, um, an attitude of intolerance towards what I'm experiencing. Pain can be tolerable. Uh, pain can be happening to me, mental, emotional, physical pain can be happening, and I can still be like, okay, I don't like this, um, it's painful, but it's not a deal breaker. I'm still willing to participate with life despite this. Um, I have maybe some kind of strength inside of me that's like, I, I can I can handle this, but when you're sort of overloaded, when your distress tolerance is maxed out, um, and you're like, eject, eject, I got to get out of this situation. I can't handle this. Um, or if you feel like your whole life is like an intolerable existence, that's suffering. That's the kind of thing that motivates Buddhism. Okay, so with that on the table, the existence of that kind of attitude is what disturbs Buddhism. And it wants to address that. Now, it thinks most people try to solve the problem of suffering by trying to control their environment. If there's certain experiences that provoke this attitude of suffering in a person, then what they try to do 
is avoid those circumstances and protect themselves against it by trying to control with power the world around them. That's an outward focused kind of way of orienting toward life. Buddhism says this is a mistake and that it, it doesn't solve the problem of suffering at all and that you will inevitably suffer and actually you are suffering already. I mean, just even being in that position, there is suffering happening inside of you, whether you recognize it or not. Um, you maybe have heard of the Four Noble Truths and the first noble truth of Buddhism, the first realization the Buddha has when he's becoming enlightened is um, that life is suffering, all of it. That when you don't think you're suffering, you really still are suffering. You're just suffering a little less than normally, so it feels good <laughs> that like experiencing play, uh, pleasure or happiness, if you experience joy, um, that many times that is really just slightly less suffering than normal. Pretty depressing. <laughs> there are there are three other noble truths though that are not depressing. Although I'm just going to leave you at that because I am limited on time. Um, so Buddhism recommends instead trying to control your inner circumstances. Instead of trying to use power on the world around you, change yourself and your own attitudes. Um, uh, the, the a very often quoted phrase in Buddhism in a lot of Buddhist texts are the wise control themselves. Um, the Fletcher controls the shaft of the arrow. The person who's like making arrows, like they they know how to control the angle of it. Uh, they they use a bunch of different analogies of like skills. And the skill of wisdom is learning how to shape your own character to eliminate suffering. So this outer inward sort of journey that Wines is talking about here is, I think, derivative of this, especially when he's talking about the psychotherapeutic path here, um, the, this turning of effort from controlling external circumstances to changing our inner attitudes. Um, that's a kind of cool, interesting idea. I definitely think that there are, uh, that meaning can't be like restricted to just this sort of inner stuff. Um, and that what goes on outside also matters, and Buddhism would say that too. The other, uh, the the part of um, eliminating the ego and detachment as these ways of working inwardly to uh, prevent suffering or to sort of decondition suffering um, is also coupled equally with an emphasis on compassion for others in Buddhism. So there's a kind of balance of those two things. Um, I don't know how much I want to go into psychotherapy. I say here, I'm going to discuss the part that Wines doesn't explain. Um, psychoanalysis is pretty cool too, but uh, you might have heard of Freud, Sigmund Freud. Um, Freud is, I don't agree with everything he has to say, but a lot of his um, basic theoretical approach uh, to psychology through psychotherapy um, and psychoanalysis is sort of interesting. Um, Okay, I'll give you a little bit of it. This is also about the inward journey a little bit. Um, seeing success on what you're working on inside of you. Again, this is probably going to be related to some of the other models we've already been talking about in this lecture. Um, so psychoanalysis famously says you have a subconscious and you have a conscious. And there's actually even, there's some more divisions here. There's a an id, an ego, and a superego. And I'm not going to get into all the details here, but the kind of in a nutshell premise is that as you're going through life, you have a bunch of competing desires, and you have competing models of meaning, and a bunch of experiences to make sense of. And in that mess, your, your mind is trying to just make the best of it at, that it can. And it does a lot of this uh, path of least resistance, like making psychic connections and associations between things without really thinking about that in the big picture. Or instead of a lot of times, especially in psychoanalysis, the the model is that your mind doesn't really want to resolve conflicts, but it wants to let all of the things that are in conflict exist simultaneously in your psyche. It's not going to be cutting things out. What it'll do instead is repress them. So instead of like changing them, it just ignore them. A, a classic case would be this: say you got competing desires. Uh, there's a pleasure you want, um, but you also have a value against that thing. You have like a second order desire that says, no, I shouldn't want that. But both desires exist in you. And your subconscious, or what often happens is, what you'll do is, uh, the solution here as your psychology sees it, um, is to do the thing that you want 
and then feel bad about it. So both desires get satisfied. Right? You get the thing that you wanted, your first order desire is satisfied, and the guilt that you feel or the shame that you feel about it is a way of like showing deference to that other desire to satisfy what it was asking for. Because it's saying that shouldn't have happened. And so by feeling guilty, you can accommodate both things. You know, you, it's a win-win. <laughs> but that's pretty messy. It creates neurosis. It creates psychosis and mental illness. So what Freud thinks uh, is the solution is to go on an inward journey where you, through psychotherapy, you know, someone might help with this, um, like the famous picture of like someone laying down on the couch and they're being like drawn through their dreams and maybe it's almost a hypnotic. Um, the, but the idea here is through reflection and investigation, you pull up all the subconscious crap that you're not aware of and bring it into the conscious realm so that it can be worked on rationally. I mean, that's, it's really a, a kind of philosophical therapy almost that Freud has in mind. That's, a, that's the impression I get in many places from his writings. That you, you're able to kind of look at those things and accept them, and, and, but also to think about them rationally and say, oh, maybe I want to make some changes here and kind of clean that up. Instead of the, your psyche just kind of like running this messy engine that's constantly making messes. Every time it's solving, it's cleaning one mess, it's making another mess kind of thing. It's not thinking long term, it's very short term um, with the problem that's right in front of it. But by reflecting on yourself and holding all these things in balance together in conscious thought, um, you can kind of clean that up. It's kind of like a mental hygiene that psychotherapy is supposed to help with. Um, now, I'm not an expert in psychoanalysis, so if anyone out there is, they might be like, oh, you're misunderstanding some stuff, Tim. Very possible. But that, that kind of um, broad strokes, uh, ham, maybe ham-fisted way of presenting psychoanalysis, I think is where Wines is going with this and how he's connecting it in with this kind of model of meaning, um, that there's a lot to find uh, and to participate with that is meaningful just even within our own subconscious and our own psyches and and resolving those kinds of things. The other thing I think it's really interesting that he talks about is the balance between public and private life, um, between kind of your relationship with yourself in this inward journey, and then the outward looking sort of stuff too. Um, like I said uh, in my lecture notes here, I think this is really connected with standard three, which was this... Um, uh, sainthood or universalizing faith slash moral ideal kind of um, model of success. Um, I definitely think he thinks that's also important. So it'd be kind of like pursuing personal enlightenment and social justice or something like that kind of balance is important to wines. I don't have a particular problem with that. Um, most of my complaints about wines are uh, he doesn't uh, define this sort of proposal that he's making very... Um, uh, very clear. He doesn't. He doesn't explicate that in a very clear manner. He doesn't do a real good job shouldering the burden of proof on defending it either, in my opinion. But that's a much bigger thing and uh, hard to get into in a quick two-hour lecture like this, where we're just trying to open up the can of worms of the meaning of life. So, like I said at the beginning of this video, we weren't going to settle on any solutions, but we have a lot more answers here to choose from. I think. At least I hope that's how you feel about what we've explored in this reading and in, in the lecture here tonight. Um, I, I hope this gives you some food for thought and uh, enriches your own efforts to reflect on this question. Like I alluded to earlier, um, I think philosophy presents a lot of meaning to life. And the pursuit of even asking the question and exploring these sorts of options, um, not just theoretically, but also in how they relate into your life in a concrete way, is um, I think it's a big part of being human. But I also think it's a big part of, uh, it maybe combines a bunch of these models, especially like the Emersonian model and the uh, sainthood model, where it's like connecting with something that's bigger than yourself. Um, all of us have our own little picture or vision of happiness or meaning for ourselves, um, but there's a wider world of options out there and to engage with them and to think about them and maybe even entertain and entertain them to the point of changing some of your opinions about them, I think is a, a meaningful process to engage in. Um, there's a lot of meaning to be found in having a relationship with meaning itself. 
Um, and in that way, I think even, and this is part of my interest in despair, even in thinking about meaninglessness, there is a lot of meaning. Um, but I'll, maybe I'll just leave it at that. I do have my own whole ethical theory, but uh, I'm not going to get into all of it here. Um, I do I do like leaving with some of these final thoughts that Wines put. I, there's a lot of, like I say here, axe grinding. And I, you know, I'm trying to pull out, I think, what is maybe, I'm trying to read him charitably here. And I think the, there's there's one thing he's sort of saying here that, or a couple things that I think are, are good points to take away. And I agree with him about, in sort of approaching this question in general. That all this kind of theoretical dreaming is great and crucial. Uh, like I was just saying, perhaps it's a meaningful activity in itself. But the reality uh, is that, this is something that actually has to be a part of our lives. And uh, we don't do this very often. Um, and much less doing it with other people. Um, where I say here where it would be reflected in the world. And I think that's pretty important. Um, I have so much sympathy and understanding for how, for why this happens. For why we don't think about this question more. Much less do it with other people. Uh, you know, think back to all the stuff I was saying at the beginning of the quarter about how risky it is uh, to get into open debate about the especially deeply personal things like how we think of the meaning of life. Like, just imagine going to someone you know and being like, tell me about the meaning of life. I'm listening to you. I think you're wrong about that. Here's all my problems with how you've made meaning out of your life. It'd just be like, whoa, that doesn't seem nice or respectful or any of those things. Um, so I think having this kind of discussion, especially in the critical way of really exploring it, is uh, is something very intimate, um, and that is an obstacle to doing it, but it's also something really valuable when you can make it happen. Um, and I encourage, I personally encourage you to look for opportunities. At least be looking for them. Like you don't always have to try to like force them. Like, hey, so how are you thinking about the meaning of life today? You know, like you don't have to do stuff like that all. But um, you might be surprised when you start. I'm, I've had this experience many times in my life. If you're just open to it, you might be surprised at how many opportunities for in engaging with other people around those questions just fall into your lap. Um, and I, I think they're they're a good call to answer when it shows up. And as Wine says, there are also all these other burdens and pressures of life um, that might make it feel like to spend time agonizing over questions of the meaning of life is a luxury that you can't afford. Um, but I, I might challenge that. A, I might challenge that a little bit. Um, I've met some people who are under tremendous cares and concerns, and in some ways, connecting with this part of being alive to to ask these questions about meaning can be part of what carries you through it. And, and can also give guidance for uh, maybe changing course if you need to, too. Sometimes crisis forces this question onto us, um, and we might be thankful for it later. That's definitely happened to me in my life, and I've seen that happen to many other people around me. Like I was saying earlier, you don't have to wait for a midlife crisis, too. Um, but sometimes that's what happens. Um, but I also think uh, if we care about this stuff, then we should also care about the way that our world is set up, um, especially in thinking about one of the major aspects of our world, which is the world of business and economics, and seeing those as a big part of what conditions our existence as a society and as people, as individuals who live in that context. I think it's worth asking these questions about it and not treating it as a separate topic, not something that's, oh, it's for my philosophy class, but as something that um, to integrate with all the rest of it. And to look for ways in which maybe we can create a world in which people can think about this stuff, where they don't have to be under all these um, burdens of working 80 hours a week and being a student at the same time, which maybe some of you are in that kind of boat, um, that you do have the time to be able to put to this in a sincere sort of way, and that we can create um, contexts for ways of relating to each other that enable these kinds of conversations to be a joint enterprise that's productive, healthy, and positive, instead of something... Uh, terrible and abusive. So that's a lot of Tim Lenneman's two cents here, but um, maybe a good note to go off on, uh, to go out of the quarter with. Um, I do think it's an important question. If you really care about meaning, um, 
which I think everyone does, <laughs> but maybe whether you care about being critically reflective about it, um, then it's a question of how to integrate it in a realistic way in your life. How do you make it not just a nice picture that you tell yourself? We do that a lot. There's been a lot of wonderful work in moral psychology over the last 20 years um, that's shown just how much we confabulate our own values. Like we say we care about all these different things and we even really believe that we're living in accordance with those values, but our actions don't reflect it. It takes, I, I've learned to respect how it takes a lot of effort to put your money where your mouth is, to really live a life uh, where your actions are consistent with what you believe to be meaningful and valuable. Um, so I hope this class has helped you with that project, and I, I hope it's empowered you and given you some tools for how to think about this stuff. And uh, at any time ever, if you want to talk about this stuff more, um, like I was saying at the beginning of the lecture, um, my door is always open, and I'll always welcome and enjoy having a conversation with you. So um, I hope that will happen. I hope that will happen sometime in the future. Good luck with everything that you're finishing up. Um, probably by the time you watch this video, it might already be done. Um, so maybe in an early way, congratulations. Um, and uh, yeah, I hope you enjoyed the quarter. And I really enjoyed talking with all of you. Um, I mean that really sincerely. Um, uh, I've given a lot of comments out there that I not I haven't necessarily heard responses to, but I've really enjoyed uh, the privilege of being able to read your work and get a little window into what you think and what you value. Um, thank you for giving me that access. I hope I've uh, treated it with respect or that you've experienced it that way. Um, and if I haven't, let me know. Um, that's that's definitely my intention at all times. And any point down the road, you know, if you ever want to respond to some of my comments, I'd I'd welcome that too. Okay, I'm just repeating myself at this point. But have a great summer and thanks for everything.